So for the next talk, we have Lynn Lin, who is a professor of applied math at Berkeley. Lynn Lin's been working in um, sort of the analysis and methods for quantum chemistry for many years and has more recently in the last few years been doing a lot of work in quantum algorithms as well. He's had a, a lot of success there showing um, some, some pretty impressive algorithms in a number of cases. So today he's going to tell us about quantum computation of Green's functions. Thanks, Ryan. Can you see the screen? Yes. OK, great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and the introduction. Today, I'm very glad to talk about some of our recent works on quantum computation of uh, Green's functions. So this is a joint work with uh, two of my brilliant students, and uh, Yu Tong, who's a fourth year grad student, and uh, Don Wan, who's a fifth year student. He's going to join uh, Maryland as a Hartree Fellow in quantum information this fall and also Nathan Weep, and uh, it is mainly based on this paper. So yesterday, we've already heard from uh, Zhang Ho uh, talking about the importance of going beyond the ground state, uh, and uh, many, uh, several other speakers also uh, said, uh, talked about this. So indeed, if you want to look at the spectroscopy information in general, Green's functions is the way to go, is because of the following Lehman representation. So the so-called single particle Green's function is basically a matrix, and uh, you can do this factorization. If you can factorize it in this way, these things corresponds to poles in a complex plane, and these are called the quasi-particle energy. If you look at this, on a, uh, this is a cartoon, and showing that below the chemical potential, you have a bunch of uh, uh, poles here. Above the chemical potential, you have a bunch of other poles here. And uh, from these pole structures, you can read, uh, uh, read out a lot of useful chemistry and the materials information, such as the ionization potential, electron affinity, so on and so forth. If you look at the Green's functions, the imagery the part of it, then this is called the spectral function. And uh, this is a recent calculation joint work with the Brigitte's group uh, for the Harbaugh model. But uh, this has been done for many other realistic materials. Basically, if you can compute these quantities at the many body level, it allows you to address many experimental challenges, such as uh, for the emission spectroscopy, inverse for the emission spectroscopy, angular resolved things, and so, so on and so forth. So what are these quasi-particles? I found the explanation here by classical explanation by Matuk, uh, very useful. Basically, uh, he used this cartoon saying that if you just think about the one particle, you think about it's a horse, and this is a real horse, and the elect like the electron moves around. But what if you really add the electron to a material or remove the electron from the material? It's not like you just uh, knocked the electron out. Uh, the uh, material also need to respond. This is like a horse runs into a dust. The horse is going to react to the dust, and the horse is going to cough, the dust is going to float around, so on and so forth. But if you really view this uh, many particle system as a system, it is still more or less a horse. So this is called a quasi horse. So this is exactly the so called quasi particle idea, which means that if you add some excitation to the system, then you look at the bare particle together with the response of the material, this whole thing as a quasi particle. So the quasi electron means that if you add electron to a system, you also look at the response, and the quasi hole means you remove the electron, and this is exactly what the, what the so called photoemission uh, spectroscopy does. So, more mathematically, uh, we have seen this a couple of times for the quantum antibody problem. We assume the second quantized formulation. You have an n-size or spin orbitals where the AI, AI dagger, these are the annihilation and creation operators. The many-body Hamiltonian nominally is a huge matrix of size 2 to the n. Uh, it can generally be written into the summation of two parts. One is the non-interacting part H0, and the other is the interacting part. And uh, importantly, this non-interacting part is a quadratic Hamiltonian, and H1 is this quartic Hamiltonian. So we also write this uh, sign off to be the ground state with Ne electrons. If Ne is uh, like N, uh, it cannot exceed 2N. If it is N, it's a half fitting. But if you go to, let's say, plane wave based discretization, Ne is going to be much, much smaller than N. And E0 is the ground state energy. Uh, the problem we consider uh, in this talk is really the so-called the problem of large spectral radius. It's because in a number of scenarios, you can find that the spectral radius of H can be very large. 
And this can be very undesirable for almost everything we want to do with on quantum. On classical computers, this is also annoying. But on quantum computers, this would be beyond annoying. It would be, the cost would be really large. For example, if you go to the plane with dual or real space, causeless, uh, this kind of discretization, and you keep refining and refining, the Laplacian operator is an unbounded operator. Eventually, the single particle part will become very large, and uh, which is kind of overshadow the, uh, the two electron interaction part. Or if you think that the, there are a lot of electrons in the system and the discretization is not so fine, it may be the other way around because there are more interaction terms. Or uh, to simplify, is uh, you think about the Harvard model. Uh, there are two parameters. There's a T, there's a U. If T becomes very large, U is small, then H is going to be dominated by the T part. If the, in the large U limit, it's going to be dominated by the, uh, by the uh, interaction part. Uh, similar considerations also happens in QED, such as the Hamiltonian formulation of the Schwinger model. We also talked about that. Uh, but uh, 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 but uh, in this talk, we won't talk about the QED model. In general, uh, what we're going to think about is uh, the Hamiltonian can be separated into two parts, A plus B. The spectral radius of A is much, much larger than B. If we just stop here, we wouldn't be able to do anything. But the point is that A is somewhat easy to manipulate so that you can get access to a much more efficient way of expressing the block encoding of some functions of A. So this is really the key. Um, so the informal result looks like the following, uh, which is uh, if you look at the existing algorithms, so there are very few papers so far uh, talking about the Green's function computation. But I do think it's a, actually a very important problem and very worth looking at. So if you adopt uh, HHL to solve the Green's function problem directly, and uh, uh, we just heard from Guang Hao the block encoding technique, I'm going to talk about that further, then the number of block encodings would pretty much depend on uh, the spectral radius of H, which is bad. There's a further uh, unpleasant dependence uh, on the precision, which is epsilon square. Using uh, more uh, advanced techniques, uh, such as a linear combination of unitary or this uh, quantum singular value transformation, you can improve this epsilon square to epsilon. There is a polylog factor uh, following that. We neglect that. And uh, uh, but the, the dependence, would, there is still this linear dependence with respect to the spectral radius of H. Uh, our work reduces this to uh, no dependence on the spectral norm of A, but at most uh, polynomial it depends on the spectral radius of B, which is the small guy. And uh, polynomial, because you still have this uh, sigma mean factor, but this is the worst case bound. Usually, it's much better than that. So you should expect in practice there should be a linear or close to linear dependence with respect to the uh, spectral radius of B. So what are the Green's functions? Uh, so these are I'm going to talk about the so-called time-ordered single particle Green's function, or Green's function for short, in the frequency domain. Um, so if you really read the textbooks like Nigeli and Orlan or Feta and Alaska, there are, I don't know, six or eight different flavors of them. They are kind of similar-ish, at least mathematically. So we're just going to talk about this. Um, so it is separated into two parts. Uh, one is called the advanced Green's function. The other is called the retarded Green's function. Advanced and retarded are with respect to time. So mathematically, what it does is if you already have the ground state, what you first do is to uh, apply this uh, creation operator onto the ground state. And then you uh, solve a gigantic linear system. Remember, this is 2 to the n by 2 to the n. And then you either do an inner product here, or you just uh, apply another annihilation operator and then inner product with a psi naught. A similar thing happens for the retarded Green's function, other than you first apply the annihilation operator. So our goal is really assume that you're given this, given this, given this. This is a frequency parameter. For each of the, this ij, and ij goes from a 1 to n, uh, you compute this n by n matrix. So the number of uh, readouts you need to do is poly n. So that gives you some hope that uh, this, is, uh, this problem is not just you solve a linear system stored in the quantum computer, but actually you have some classical readout. And we're also going to assume that there's some broadening parameter, which is the imaginary part of z should be bigger than something for the broadening. Otherwise, this problem is singular. So uh, although this formulation looks really complicated, 
I want to say that uh, for the non-interacting system, it, the problem can be miraculously uh, simplified. So, uh, which means that if H only depends on uh, the non-interacting part, so it's a quadratic Hamiltonian, then there's a very simple analytic, solu analytic solution. It means that the Green's function is nothing but a matrix inverse or the resolvent. So you literally take this T matrix, Z minus T inverse, and then you're done. And this F ends there become the, the so-called the quasi-particle wave functions are nothing but the bona fide eigenfunctions of this uh, Hamiltonian T. So these are what we call the bare horse or the bare Green's function. Uh, the interesting part would be with interaction, where this GZ becomes the quasi horse. We heard on Monday from uh, 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 from Frank's talk that the important thing, the so-called self-energy, this uh, uh, sigma Z is defined to be the inverse of Z minus the inverse of uh, a G naught. Uh, so this is not just a garbage collection term, but uh, it actually has a lot of physical meaning. It has a lot of physical meaning just by looking at the next simplest setting, which is the quantum impurity. Uh, so this is an example, a uh, simplest example for the single impurity Anderson model, where everything is quadratically interacting. It doesn't matter how this looks like, but there for this uh, spinful side, you have this uh, quartic interaction. And we're interested in the computation of the Green's function for this system. So uh, this problem is uh, simple enough. I can just uh, directly diagonalize everything and compute it, even though I just added a tiny bit of a perturbation here in this one side. But if you look at the perturbation to the Green's function, this is completely global everywhere, OK? There's no clear pattern, so on and so forth. Maybe eventually it will decay, but uh, it's in general global perturbation. But remember, the sigma is defined to be the difference of the inverse then the difference is completely localized around the impurity. So this is this fact. So, so that is why one of the reasons why you want to look at this as sigma. So uh, this fact is really the foundation of many methods, especially those based on the Green's functions, such as dynamical mean field theory, QMC. And there's been, a, as far as I've been talking to physicists, has been a folk theorem at least since Feynman, and can be easily motivated from diagrammatic arguments. As a matter of fact, this fact is in every code, so there's no way you can get around that. But um, as far as I know, every, when I ask like uh, where this is approved, uh, is uh, at least so far I haven't got the answer. Eventually, we realized that we probably want to write it down. So it's kind of uh, fun, in some way funny that so this very famous fact, as far as uh, we know, the non-perturbative proof is really for general impurities, bosons, fermions, uh, cardinal of beam contours, so on and so forth, was written down in 2020. So, but if you have a better reference, uh, I'll be very glad to know. So, um, uh, so uh, what we are interested in, in general, are of course, uh, Green's functions with a more general form of interaction is not just uh, like impurities, uh, most of the practical calculations are done in this field are based on hartree falk or DFT. This is essentially a non-interacting picture. Uh, if the interaction terms are small, usually what you do is with uh, some sort of many-body perturbation theory, GF2, GW, second order, couple clusters, so on and so forth. So, uh, and with this, uh, you can already gain a lot. Uh, this is a, a pretty famous picture that if you, for a bunch of uh, materials, uh, if you do the DFT-based calculation, the LDA is used as an illustrative example. The band gap compared to the experimental band gap would be significantly uh, and systematically underestimated. Uh, but if you do a simple G0, W0 perturbation theory calculation, this would uh, largely restore the trend, at least. There are still uh, important quantitative differences to be considered around on the order of 0.5 EV to an EV, but this is already much better than the DFT calculation. Uh, and uh, for the large H1, uh, all bets are off. Uh, you can either do some uh, exact dynamization or a quantum Monte Carlo DMRG or some sort of quantum embedding calculations. What we want to do is to work this out for uh, quantum computers. Uh, the quantum strategy compared to the classical counterparts, uh, to some extent, they are often easier in the sense that um, the classical algorithms do not try to, do not even hope to solve this exactly. So they introduce all kinds of approximations and later 
uh, things will become pretty complicated. Quantum uh, has the promise of uh, solving the problem exactly or with uh, some sort of error guarantee. So we're going to just uh, pursue it in a brute force way. It's so brute force that it is essentially a matrix matrix multiplication. What I'm saying here is that remember each entry of this Green's function is the sandwich uh, between uh, between the psi naught and psi naught. You have this a product of annihilation and a big Green's function and a creation. Let's call this matrix A. And I just want to literally write this write this circuit down, or at least in an approximate way. So if you look at this thing, uh, uh, this part, this is basically uh, solving a gigantic quantum linear system or quantum linear system problem. So if you want to solve this directly, I just want to say that um, uh, in the past decade, there has been uh, significant progress in the past few years, uh, starting from the groundbreaking HHL algorithm with a certain query complexity. And uh, so many uh, efforts have been made to uh, really reduce the dependence, for example, with respect to the uh, with respect to the uh, precision, reduce the dependence with respect to the condition number, which is the ratio between the um, uh, largest and the smallest single value of the matrix A, or how to recently we have considered how to remove some of the uh, complicated subroutines, such as a VTA or uh, some uh, repeated phase estimation, so on and so forth. And uh, we have uh, a lot of understanding now how to solve a generic quantum linear system uh, system problems matching the complexity of lower bounds. Uh, also, another thing I want to say is, in order to compute the Green's functions, the first thing you need to do is to find the ground energy and also to prepare the ground state. Um, the most well-known result along this direction is phase estimation. and uh, uh, and uh, the, But uh, in terms of a complexity, the previously the best results were obtained by Syracuse group. Last year, we improved on that, and uh, especially in terms of uh, 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 the finding the ground energy uh, with respect to the gap. You know, there's uh, some polynomial improvements with respect to the gap, and in some cases, such as uh, using the initial state, and uh, there's some uh, exponential improvement with respect to the uh, to the gap. So, um, uh, just like uh, yesterday. Uh, we put out another paper because many of these algorithms are so, not so friendly to the, I wouldn't call it the near term. We had a little bit of discussion uh, before in, uh, uh, like, uh, in the breakout room. And I asked uh, Bella what is the early four torrent quantum computer. Uh, I, I, I still don't know exactly what the definition is. We tried to give a, a vague description there, but it removes uh, uh, a lot of the assumptions um, uh, especially the a lot of the multiple qubit controls in these algorithms, and uh, you only need one, or if you want zero, and set up qubit, and uh, with a simple circuit that you can estimate the ground state energy with uh, some Heisenberg limit. So, uh, okay, let me just uh, uh, talk briefly what the block encoding is, although we just heard about that. So um, we know quantum gates needs to be unitary. Uh, this guy that we want is not unitary. So the idea is that you want to, ex in the general idea is you want to extend like n qubit non-unitary matrix to a n plus m qubit unitary matrix. As far as I know, this idea was uh, uh, has been used implicitly for a long time. It was formally written down by Guang Hao and the Isaac Tron in 2016 and uh, initially called it the standard form, but now I think the community seems to have converged to the term block encoding. The basic idea is that you have a non-unitary matrix A, you divide by a proper big enough uh, factor alpha called the block encoding factor, so that this guy is small enough, you can put uh, this efficiently to the upper left corner of a unitary matrix called UA. It's a mouthful of stuff, but uh, if you think about it for a second, you realize this is the natural natural language to talk about this, at least at the level of a gray box. Many examples of a block encoding have been worked out in this, uh, I think, seminal paper. And uh, um, uh, and especially if you even want to do addition and the multiplication of block encoded matrix, uh, you can do it. So the basic strategy of computing uh, Green's functions on the quantum computer uh, is that if you can block encode this big inverse, there's a big if. You need to 
we need to talk about how to, how to do that, uh, but with the flavor of quantum linear system solver. Then uh, we heard from Guang Hao's talk that this, this are easy because you can use the uh, uh, Jordan Wigner transformation, which essentially gives uh, efficient block encoding for these two sparse matrices. You can product them together. So this becomes a, a whole thing has efficient uh, uh, unitary block encoding called the UA. Then you just run the hard model test. Uh, so if you run this version of the hard model test and uh, you measure how frequently you obtain zero, then you just do simple algebra, find that the success probability is one half, one plus the real part of the thing you want, where this part is uh, the ground state. Similar circuits, you just modify here a bit at the phase gate, you will get the imaginary part. And uh, this one circuit per se uh, has a like a non-optimal dependence with respect to the precision, but you can improve bump it up uh, with the standard amplitude estimation technique. So uh, this one is a slightly more formal uh, in the sense that previously I was uh, cheating a bit, saying that you can depend directly on the spectral radius of H, and that depends on how efficiently you know uh, to get the block encoding. What you actually get, but it's not that far away. So the standard algorithm, they would depend on the uh, block encoding factor of H, and our algorithm depends on the block encoding factor of B. And the key idea here is uh, you need something called the fast inversion. So uh, let me briefly say what the fast inversion idea is. Uh, the simplest idea is for diagonal matrices. It has a lot of similarity with the well-known fast forwarding technique, but there is also some subtle differences. I'm going to neglect the subtle differences because of the uh, uh, because of time, but I just emphasize the connection. So if I have a diagonal matrix called D, so that it's invertible, so the inverse of that, the smallest entry of D is uh, some uh, omega one, and the, but the largest the entry is very large. So if you directly block encode that, uh, it's very costly. Assume that uh, we can have access to the entries of D. There must be a, such an oracle somewhere. Uh, for example, I can just uh, we uh, put the values of D in some uh, worker register. Then the idea is extremely simple. Uh, you want to use some classical arithmetic that once you read, you write the entries of D uh, to uh, the worker register and use a classical arithmetic with some controlled rotation uh, and uh, to invert this matrix and then get the OD integer back. The important thing is that such a circuit, the circuit depth is independent of D. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually always a constant. But from this uh, toy example, uh, you can expand, uh, uh, try to expand it. The easiest thing is to uh, go to the one sparse matrix, and uh, Nathan talked about that uh, already uh, for the like uh, uh, context of Hamiltonian simulation. Uh, if A is diagonalizable, such unitarily diagonalizable, such as, as a normal matrix, where V is a unitary matrix, and uh, we assume that the D can be fast inverted and the V is uh, uh, easy to get, then you can also get a, a fast inverted version of this uh, uh, of this A inverse through this UA prime. An example of this would be that if you look at the, uh, uh, for example, the Harvard model or the plane wave uh, uh, dual uh, formulation or Gaussless, and uh, you will have this uh, T X minus Y and uh, with this uh, uh, creation annihilation A, but at the different points, X and Y, you do the fast uh, 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 fast fermion, fermionic fast Fourier transform, this uh, plays the role of the V, and inside you have uh, this uh, diagonal guy. And uh, because you know this entries analytically, you can indeed uh, do the fast inversion and uh, this means that even though the spectral radius of this term is very large, but if I want a shifted inverse of this, it does not need to be expensive. So to use this to compute the Green's functions, the key idea is uh, basically uh, the uh, is a uh, well-known technique in linear algebra called the preconditioner. Uh, the basic idea is that if I want to solve a x equal a, a plus b x equals to small b, and I know that the spectral radius of a is very large, but somehow I can compute A inverse efficiently. So what you do is to multiply A inverse on both sides of the equation, 
and then you do need to be careful about this thing here because this may not be normalized. And uh, uh, but uh, other than the technicalities, what you do is you redefine your right hand side. Now this guy, the spectral radius may be much smaller. Uh, you can do a simple bound to bound the condition number of this matrix. Basically, it will be bounded by all the inverses, which assume uh, you assume that they are well uh, they are well behaved uh, times the uh, the spectral radius of B. And uh, the resulting circuit for solving a linear system would be independent of the spectral radius of A and A plus B, respectively. Uh, so, uh, OK, so uh, this have slide wasn't there before, uh, but uh, in the breakout room, Tom mentioned about this. And uh, we just heard a much more expanded version explanation by Guang Hao, which is much better than mine here. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, let me say it. Uh, so. Uh, this slide uh, it basically says that if you really care about the scaling with respect to the number of electrons and uh, with the proper assumptions, uh, even in the second quantization formulation, you can get some dependence on the number of electrons. We heard the importance of this from Ryan's talk. So if H preserves the Hamiltonian, which means H and uh, the projection to uh, any sector of uh, uh, the Hamiltonian, these two operators commute, then the Hamiltonian uh, or whatever operation you do would preserve the number of electrons. So if the number of electrons is much smaller than N, if you directly do the precondition Hubbard solver, uh, then the cost would uh, have a polynomial dependence on the number of spin orbitals but you can actually reduce this to an E cube. The basic idea is exactly as Wen Hao said that you need to, uh, you can easily use a classical arithmetic to count the number of electrons. Uh, and if it is uh, inside the uh, uh, inside what you want, you do something. If it is outside, uh, then you just uh, discard it instead of uh, put a very big penalty there. And this is the quantum circuit for one part, which is the uh, um, uh, the non-interacting part. So, uh, OK, in the finally few uh, minutes, let me uh, talk about uh, uh, you can also use uh, similar preconditioned techniques to deal with the finite temperature effects, such as uh, Gibbs state preparation. So the idea is you want to prepare a thermal state rho beta, that is uh, this uh, exponential beta h, and z beta is the normalization factor. Uh, the uh, idea that's often used in the literature is you consider this purified Gibbs state, uh, which is a pure state. And if you trace out the first register, you obtain the mixed state, which is exactly rho beta. And uh, what you want is um, uh, to apply this operator to some initial state, for example, the maximally mixed state, so that you can trace out the first register and get this row. Uh, we developed two new approaches uh, to convert. Basically, the idea is to convert the problem of general matrix computation to, uh, to preconditioned linear system problem. Uh, so the first uses a very well-known technique called the Cauchy's Concord Integral Formula. Uh, that is, if you uh, have a function that you, you only care about it on the real axis, but you think about things in the complex plane. And uh, if in a com complex plane, certain parts are analytical, then you can construct a contour so that this complex dependence here is only reduced to a scalar. The rest of them always look like a linear system. The second technique, which looks a little bit silly if you uh, 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 if first time you think about that, but is actually not. Uh, so you want to do this, uh, but you do this uh, identity, which is H equals H inverse and inverse. And the point is that now you have created uh, uh, you have created uh, 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 a, a linear system uh, is so that this thing you can use some efficient preconditioner uh, to deal with it. So this should be my last slide. That is, uh, for clarity, we can compare the cost of uh, preparing this state uh, with uh, some other techniques in the literature. As I said, if you choose this B to be the maximally mixed state and normalize it, this should give you the Gibbs state. So um, the uh, first work uh, should be, or one of the early works uh, is given by Pauli and Wuxian in the PRL in 2009. And uh, so there, the dependence has uh, this alpha H dependence because uh, uh, there's no preconditioning. And uh, uh, but there is a uh, one over epsilon dependence. 
Uh, last year, uh, when Appledore and collaborators improved this uh, from a log uh, one Rapsilon to log one Rapsilon, and uh, our work using the contour integrals, uh, it maintains this polylog one Rapsilon dependence, and uh, the dependence here is only on B. Uh, so uh, thank, thank you very much for your attention.